Welcome to, Rev to Congregation Lador Vidor's Touch of Torah with Rabbi Barry Silver. And tonight is June 28th, and we're going to be speaking about the Parsha in the Book of Numbers called Korach. Take it away, Rabbi. Thank you so much, Sharon. It's great to be here. We got people coming in from different places across the country. What we're going to do tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about the Torah reading, which is really exciting. And then we're going to open up the discussion to what is on the minds of many people, the abortion situation and uh, how, what religion has to say about it and the influence of religion. You will notice behind me, there's a wall. It's the Western wall, the retention wall at, at the synagogue, the temple in Jerusalem. And the whole issue involves a wall, the wall of separation between church and state. So it's appropriate that there's a strong ancient wall behind me. Uh, this week we're going to be reading from the section called Korach, and Korach is one of the reasons why the Bible is a bestseller and one of the most popular books ever written. The Bible has lots of sex and violence and intrigue and drama, and this passage does not disappoint. In this passage you have some rabble-rousers led by Korach, and Korach is complaining to Moses and saying that Moses is an egomaniac and he's trying to seize power and he's stirring up a rebellion. And meanwhile, Moses has actually been the opposite. He's been very humble. In fact, when the Jewish people went astray and they were worshiping the golden calf and God said, I'm going to destroy these people and start over with you, Moses did a very courageous thing. He challenged God. He talked back to God. God could have said, well, chutzpah, I'll kill you too. But Moses said, do not be upset with them. If they went astray, it's my fault. I'm the leader. Take my life if you must, but don't harm the people. If only we had leaders like that today. And so Moses was a very, very humble, but Korach was painting him to be someone terrible. According to the interpretation of the Sedra, that's because Korach didn't really believe that. He just lusted for power. We see that today in campaign speeches. One party says the other one is terrible, and they don't really necessarily believe it. They just say terrible things in order to try to get themselves elected and to gain power. And uh, Moses says, you know, Korach, you come from an esteemed family, you're part of the Levitical class, you're part of the Jewish people. Is this not enough? Must you always insist on seeking power for yourself? And so what happens is Korach does persist, and he gathers people around him. Uh, we see that today in the United States. We see people who lust for power and who are able to lure people like lemmings to follow them, even though what they're saying is patently absurd and just based on ego, and they follow them anyway into a perdition. And so they lined up behind Korach, and Moses said, let all who are with Korach stand with him, and let all who are for the side of justice and right, let them stand with us. And then he makes a bold prediction. He says, today we will see if what I'm saying is true. If what I'm saying is true and Korach is a very bad hombre, then he will not die a natural death. God will create some type of death unique for him that you've never seen before. And so, and he warns the people, don't hang out with Korach. If you get mixed up with him, it's going to be bad for you. That teaching from the Bible is very important. We had a leader named McCarthy, Joe McCarthy in the 50s. He was a very bad hombre too. He gathered a lot of people around him and all of them suffered terribly because of that. And the political party, the Republican party suffered for years. So what happens in this story, Moses says, stay away from him. And many people didn't, they clung to him. And according to the Torah, the earth opened up, swallowed up, Korach swallowed up his followers and their children and all their possessions as they screamed 
and they were swallowed into the earth, and then the earth covered them over, and they were never heard from again. Modern Jews find this a very fanciful story, but not an accurate story. Modern Jews don't believe this ever happened, but it does tell us an important message. My father used to say, many stories in the Bible never happened, but they're all true. By that he meant that they have a truth to the story, a teaching that's important for us to gather. Just like we can read The Wizard of Oz or some of our favorite books and movies, they may not be literally true, but they can teach us quite a bit. So what is it, what is it teaching us here? Stay away from evildoers. Don't gather around complainers. They're only going to bring you down, that you're a, you, uh, your fate is tied with those that you align yourself with. And also, don't be greedy and lust for power. Be content with who you are and what you have. If power is thrust upon you or fame and fortune, consider yourself blessed. But don't seek it out to the extent that you're going to invite disaster. Our ancestors didn't know what caused an earthquake. They had no explanation of based on plate tectonics. They didn't know that we were on a planet with a hot center and a cooling outer crust. They didn't know that. So they attributed an earthquake to something they couldn't understand to God. Our ancestors never heard of the germ theory of disease. So if somebody got sick, they would say, God is punishing them. They didn't know about meteorology. So they thought if there was a lightning bolt, maybe God's getting a little angry and he's gonna zap somebody. Uh, today we know better. We know that these stories are uh, imaginative and creative, but they're not true and not accurate. But we can still learn many things from the story of Korach. And one of the things we learn is that we should choose humility over hubris. This is something that happens in Greek mythology. It plays out all the time. Hubris is one of the great evils. And so let me transition from this into the abortion situation. We have a group of people, fundamentalist Christians, who demonstrate the hubris of Korach. In what way do they do that? Well, they, they take Jewish scripture and then they call it their own. And they say the Jewish Bible is now our Bible and we'll add a little bit to it. And they have the right to do that. I mean, imitation is the highest form of flattery. If they want to use the Jewish Bible and call it theirs and appropriate it for themselves, they have the right to do it. If they want to distort its meaning beyond all recognition, and instead of saying like Jews say that we're created good and pure with a pure soul and a divine image, if they want to convert that into something perverse and say, no, we're born evil with original sin, they have the right to do it. If we say God is one and that's our central belief and they say God is three, they can do that. If we say that we believe in a creative power in this universe that's inspiring us to love, and they want to say, oh, no, no, we believe in a God who's going to torture people forever, the vast majority of people who ever live forever, because they don't believe the right way. And they want to believe in an intolerant God, which breeds intolerance in them. They can even do that, as distasteful as it is. But what is the height of hubris and hypocrisy and chutzpah is for them to take Jewish scripture, twist it beyond all recognition, and then force it back on the people who wrote it and say, we'll tell you what it means, and we're going to make it the law of the land, and your law no longer matters. You now must submit to our law. And we also, by the way, need to instruct Jewish people about the sanctity of life. You don't really get it. We do. We understand that life is sacred. You don't. So therefore, we're going to impose our laws upon you and force you to recognize the sanctity of life because you and the women who bear children are incapable of doing that. And not just Jewish people, but all women are incapable. We'll do that for you. That is chutzpah. That is arrogant. It's especially hypocritical coming from people who back candidates and back policies that are the opposite of life. They're not pro-life, they're pro-lie, and they're engaging in a cult of death. If they were pro-life, they would join us in fighting for universal health care. 
seeking to ban assault weapons from our streets, which have no place. They would protect our precious planet Earth. They wouldn't treat life so cavalierly that if two people have casual sex, they could say, okay, now we're going to force you into parenthood. That does not show sanctity of life. Reverence for life means that all children should be wanted children, and we should recognize the awesome responsibilities and the joys of parenthood, and recognize that when parenthood is a matter of love and choice, it's the greatest blessing. And when it is accomplished or forced upon people by the power of the state, it becomes a curse. Forcing people to become parents in an already crowded world is wrong. And we are concerned about the fetus, its potential life, and so it shouldn't be taken willy-nilly or without a thought given to it. But the fetus that we're even more concerned about are the millions and millions of people throughout the planet who are saying, feed us, feed us. We don't have any food to eat. We don't have enough to give our children. We're suffering malnutrition. Care for the people who are here and stop telling women what to do. I, I would now like to open up the floor to a discussion about the passage of Korach or the a discussion about abortion rights or something else, if you like. Um, take your choice. And uh, here at Lador Vador, we believe in free speech. So you don't have to be politically correct. We prefer you not be. You can say anything you like. And if you agree with me, I would love to hear from you. And if you disagree with me, I'd love to hear from you even more because that creates a good discussion and a good exchange of views. I now open up the floor to others. I guess uh, for the abortion thing, it's up to individual states. And I spoke to my daughter today and she says, uh, California will continue to have abortions and they expect a lot of people to come to California for the abortions. So it appears it's up to individual states how it's going to go. And uh, I guess if you're a Republican state, uh, you know, you'll have trouble. Yeah. It's like the Underground Railroad of the past. They're, they're forming an underground to take people out from these states into pro-choice states to be able to get an abortion. But of course, there's not enough funds for all the people that would need to travel. So there's going to be a lot of heartache. And it does trap people in a cycle of poverty when they have three, four, five kids, and then they get pregnant and they have the responsibility and the foresight to realize this is not gonna be good for the family, but they're required to have the child anyway. This is uh, gonna be, I believe, one of the biggest civil rights movements that we've seen clearly since the 60s. And I think that people, there will be some people who will defy the law and get arrested and be brought up on criminal charges and then you'll see something like the necessity defense. And we'll see a lot of the state attorneys don't want to prosecute. Some of the judges might not want to either. But we will see people who will get an abortion anyway and defy the law just like they did with the protests of Martin Luther King. And you will see demonstrations and protests yeah. all over the country. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's a very a sad thing, especially if you're a child waiting to get adopted which usually is an interminable wait. Now the yep. lines would be that much longer and there's gonna be more people waiting and uh, they never will get adopted. And this is a, there's just so many tragic consequences to all this from so many different angles. Um, anybody else wanna share some thoughts about, about the situation? Rabbi, do you, do you foresee that other states will take up um, a similar stance, other synagogues, um, etc. cetera? Uh, yes, I certainly do. Um, for almost 50 years, Roe v. Wade served us well and protected abortion rights under the legal theory of a right of privacy. This court now, this Dobbsian court, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with the term Hobbsian, Thomas Hobbes said that the government has to be ruthless and uh, in order to keep order. And if we want to have any sense of civil rights, we need to depend on a ruthless government, allow them to do whatever they want because it's a vicious world. That's called a Hobbesian future. We now have a, a Dobbesian 
future after Dobbs, where the right of privacy will no longer work with the uh, in this post Roe v. Wade world. Therefore, we need another Plan B to step in. That Plan B is the First Amendment. The Supreme Court said we don't agree with the right of privacy. We've looked at the Constitution. We don't see it. It's not there. Of course, in the Ninth Amendment, it says that many rights that are not enumerated are still there because it's based on a history like 50 years of history. In any event, this Supreme Court is saying it's not there. Therefore, we need another defense for abortion rights, and we have it. It's the First Amendment. They cannot say that the First Amendment is not there or they don't notice it. It's front and center. It was created by our founders for specifically for this purpose, because they did not want sanctimonious Christians trying to push their weight around as they did in Europe. They saw what happened in Europe when church and state were united. They saw pogroms and inquisitions and crusades and endless wars. They didn't want it. So they said that there's got to be a wall of separation. And a First Amendment is a very powerful argument. It hasn't been used before. It wasn't needed. And the pro-choice side basically stuck to the argument, my body, my choice. Might make sense, but we need to challenge the basic concept that the fundamentalists have foisted upon us, and it's gone unchallenged, unfortunately. And that is that human life begins at conception, and from conception on, the zygote should be given all the rights of a fully developed human being. This is an extremely irrational position, and it is appropriate because once you uh, have your mind hijacked by fundamentalist religion, any type of crazy notion can enter your head, and you're powerless to stop it because they believe on blind faith, not on facts and evidence. So to suggest that the fertilized egg is the same as a human being would be akin to saying that when you ate scrambled eggs this morning, you were really eating chicken. It would be like saying that if you stepped on an acorn, you actually just destroyed an oak tree. It would be like saying that chestnuts roasting on an open fire is equivalent to a forest fire. It's, it's, it's failing to distinguish potential from actual. And it makes as much sense as saying that if you burn the blueprints of a house, you've committed arson. The zygote is blueprints for a human being. Here's an instruction manual to create a human being, but it's not a human being. It doesn't have eyes or ears or a mouth or heart. It has nothing that a human being possesses. And by the way, for the fundamentalist Christians, if they believe that the fertilized egg is a human being, do you know who commits more abortions than anyone? That would be God himself, because the vast majority of the zygotes get washed out early on through natural causes. So they must believe that God is doing it. Actually, if you look at Numbers 531, God actually does perform an abortion. If a woman is suspected of having a child that's not her husband's, they take her to the priest, he administers a potion, it's submitted to God. And if it's not the husband's child, the fetus is lost. An abortion is committed by God. This is just one of countless examples of the fact that the Bible it approves, that it doesn't prohibit abortion and doesn't believe that life begins at conception. Uh, we do have a, a comment now from the good doctor, Dr. Homer, go right ahead. Yes, sir. I was just going to say um, there are some countries. Well, this is my first comment. There are some countries where even like removing an ectopic pregnancy because it is fertilized is illegal. And instead, they allow the mother to bleed to death um, because it's impossible for that. You know, it's, it's not possible for that to, to come to term, uh, which is very, very sad. Um, and so I, I do see some of these peoplehood and all of those type things, you know, becoming an issue. But I wanted to ask the question, how? How are you linking? Is this a federal or state lawsuit, first of all? And second of all, how are you linking the life begins at with, you know, in other words, if the Florida law, if, if that's what we're talking about, does it actually say since life begins at conception and we're all Christians, therefore, this is what we want? Do, do you understand my question? I sure do. Um, it's not quite that blatant, but almost. If they actually said we're all Christians, 
and therefore life begins at conception, they would be setting them up for failure, even with a very skewed and biased Supreme Court in Florida and the US, that really wouldn't fly. So they're a little more sophisticated than that, but not very, not much more sophisticated. They announced it in a church and there were quite a few speakers that talked about God being in control and well, we don't have to worry about the consequences of this law because we're following God's will. And so you don't have to worry. So they weren't very careful and that's going to subject them to a very strong attack from the uh, religious angle, the first amendment. But the way that we have crafted the argument is that saying that life begins a conception is a religious position and saying that you can only have abortions under certain circumstances which happen to be the same as fundamentalist christian is a religious position and therefore they're establishing fundamentalist christianity as the law for everybody and the other flip side of it is they're prohibiting the practice of judaism if i were to say to one of my congregants according to jewish law if the fetus is going to threaten your emotional well-being or your health, go have an abortion. And then she has the abortion. I now can get put in jail because I have provided assistance to someone to get an abortion. And that would then criminalize the practice of Judaism. That's where the legal argument fits in. That's how we framed it. Excellent. Thank you. And oh, I also want to let you know, and everyone, we have put the complaint on the internet, on our website, and I'm encouraging people to take that complaint. I put it in a Word document, not a PDF so it can be altered. Take that complaint, use it in your state, and instead of Florida, put it in your state, and instead of my plaintiff, Lador Vador, insert your plaintiff or your church or your synagogue. And I'm encouraging people to use this argument. It's a very, very powerful argument. And by the way, it's not just Jewish people are impacted. The majority of Christians are pro-choice. And so this can be used by a, a church saying that our reading of Christianity, our practice of Christianity is not consistent with your reading. And therefore you are infringing on my right to practice Christianity as I understand it. Um, anybody else? Uh, Wendy has her hand up. Um, in the Christian Bible, um, what exactly does it say in terms of when a um, baby is a real baby? Well, that's, that's a very good question. Okay. As I say, there's a pregnant silence. The Christian scripture doesn't say anything about when human life begins. Jewish scripture is pretty clear. It begins at birth with the first breath. Christian scripture is silent, but we can discern certain things. Jesus said, according to Christian scripture, I have not come to change a jot or a tittle of the old law. Therefore, if the Jewish scripture says life begins at birth and has no prohibition against abortion, then he doesn't either. And also, he was very silent on the issue, like Jewish scripture. So when you ask, what does Christian scripture say? Nothing explicitly, but the message is very clear that it's a pro-choice document. In fact, the Catholic Church and Christians were of a mind that life did not begin at conception until 1869, the vast majority of church history. They never believed such a thing. And so this position that fundamentalist Christians are taking, like, well, of course, this is what Christianity says. No, it isn't. It's what a small minority say today. Now, Sharon, go ahead. I just wanted to share with everybody, um, we are getting tons of communication, um, both phone calls um, to the temple, phone calls to rabbi, emails to the rabbi, emails to the congregation, donations from all across America and um, Canada, et cetera. Um, and, and, and most, I want to say 90%, I mean, I haven't looked at it, but I, I read everybody's emails and I would say 90 to 95% of them are positive. Okay. Are, are for what we want. 
Okay. Um, I want to say of the, that 90, 95%, many of these people are Christian. There are Jewish people responding, but many, many Christians, ministers, reverends, um, rabbis, I mean, a little bit of everything, you know, so I, I, I wanted to share that because, you know, it, that makes a powerful statement to what Rabbi state stating and, and supports that, that they're going along with what he is, he's intending for this case. And yeah, what it, it is, it is really amazing. And it's gratifying to see that so many caring, good people out there saying that they want to help, they're supportive. There's so many people who have said, you know, I thought the same thing. We should make the religious argument. We've never heard this before. And now they're hearing it and we're sharing it. And it's really overwhelming to see all the people that really appreciate this. I, I just want people to know before you get discouraged and think, oh, this is terrible, everybody's against us. There's a huge, vast number of Americans out there who are really good, caring, decent, people and because of our political system and the way things have been manipulated they're not really being heard but they they are the vast majority the good people it's also i'm also very gratified to hear um, sharon well first of all she's done an incredible job i mean she's already working super hard and now she's fielding all types of communication so i, I really my yarmulke is off to her but in the past people had told me under old regimes like Hey, you know, you, you don't really want to be too controversial. You want to like tone it down a little bit. And um, that that horse has already left the barn. And uh, now the whole the whole lawsuit obviously is controversial. But it's gratifying to me to hear Sharon say something about the former president and uh, and what he was doing because I really think as as Jews as people of conscience we need to speak up and tell the truth and if. Somebody's not doing something right. We need to say so. The Torah tells us that you should chastise the wrongdoer. Otherwise, you share in their iniquity. And um, Abraham Joshua Heschel, uh, he said that if, if somebody is doing something wrong, that we must criticize because in a democracy, some are guilty and all are responsible. And the reason why bad things happen is because people don't speak up. And I also want to share this. When we speak up, it should not be in a partisan way. It should not be in a political way. It should be for truth. So if you are a Democrat and your party is doing something wrong that you find troubling, it's up to you to speak up. I've spoken up about Black Lives Matter and the squad and things that I don't agree with. Doesn't make me right or wrong, but, and people can disagree, but if I see something that I think is wrong in my party, I'm saying it. And the problem is in the Republican party, if you see something wrong, you should say it. And if you don't see something wrong with the, the former President Trump, then your moral conscience is a, a bit askew, I would suggest, and you might wanna take another look. But it's not Republican versus Democrat, Jew versus Christian. It's just speaking up for what's right. I criticize the Jewish people if I think Jews are doing something wrong. I've often said that the violence of uh, ISIS and, and radical Islam, it's taken like mo many other things from Islam from Jewish scripture and the intolerance of a God who's going to be ordering genocide. We need to speak up about that. And if everybody did that, if everybody said about themselves also, I made a mistake. I did something wrong. That's how we can improve. That's how we can be better people. If the Jewish people said, you know what? Some of the things that we're doing isn't quite right. We can do better. Imagine how we could improve our society or, or our synagogue or, or our communities. So that's what this is all about. It's really about being honest in Judaism and the Pacific, truth and righteousness. And I'm glad to see that people are speaking up these days. I, I just want to show one other thing. I did an interfaith conference before this, and, and they sent me three pages of guidelines. Here's how you should frame what you're saying. And it was all very politically correct stuff. And it's like, I started out by saying, I don't think it's a good idea for us to censor ourselves. 
The problem that we've had isn't that we're speaking out too stridently. It's that we aren't strident enough. We're allowing outrages to occur and we're not saying anything. And as Netanyahu said about terrorism, the lack of outrage is the outrage. If you're denying climate change and condemning our children to a dystopian future, and you don't say anything about it, you don't chastise them, that is the outrage. Uh, Sharon, go ahead. I got a call earlier today and they asked specifically how your lawsuit may be different than the lawsuit presented by Planned Parenthood and ACLU. Can you summarize that for us, Rabbi? I sure can. And I'll provide information for you that's not known to the general public. That's one of the fringe benefits of coming into this discussion. I'm always very open and candid about what I do and what's going on even behind the scenes. So first of all, the lawsuit that I filed is night and day different than ACLU and Planned Parenthood. And let me explain why. I'm an abortion rights attorney. I have a lot of experience with the fundamentalist Christians. And as you can see, I'm not too fond of their policies and their tactics. So when I heard the leak about the abortion case, being going the wrong way with Roe v. Wade, I decided on filing a lawsuit and I was looking for a plaintiff. I went to the board of Lador Vador, and fortunately they agreed. And they said, yes, we're on board. We're gonna, we support the lawsuit. What happened then is I went to ACLU and Planned Parenthood because those two groups have frequently led the charge in litigating abortion rights. And I went to them and I said, mm -hmm. we got a problem here, Roe v. Wade, is uh, going to be overturned, and therefore the privacy argument is on the chopping block. I have another one, in addition to the privacy, which is a good one. I have another one, religious freedom. I suggest that we work together and we file a joint lawsuit and argue all of it together. Their response was, thanks, but no thanks. We're not interested in that argument. It's a sideshow. It's a distraction. It's only going to cause delay, and we need to get to court really quick because the law is going to take effect July 1, and we're urging you, please, don't file your lawsuit. Um, I, I, had a, I had a struggle a little bit with how to handle it because they are preeminent, and they've been for decades, but I've also fought for abortion rights, but I'm not presumptuous enough to think that what I've done is anywhere is equivalent to what Planned Parenthood and ACLU have done. So I deferred and I said to them, I'm not gonna back off. I think these issues need to be raised, but I will allow you to go first. And, but I still urge them to reconsider and to file together. Uh, and then what happened is they did file first and there were, and I, um, I asked for a seat at the table so I could be there too and they declined that also. So they wanted nothing to do with the arguments that I've raised. And they are arguing their case right now. And they should get a ruling, we've been told, probably by Thursday. It's a little complicated what happens next. Well, my case will then be presented on the heels of that. So my case is definitely going forward, but I deferred to them not to interfere so that they could get their case heard before July 1. What I didn't want was for them to say, ah, oh, these Jewish people, they're ruining everything. They refuse to play ball. So I, I waited. In Florida, what's going to happen is if they lose, then the religious argument is front and center, and that's the only game left in town. If they win, the state of Florida is going to appeal, and there will be an automatic stay of the decision. The state, when they appeal, can automatically stay the decision, meaning that the judge's decision to outlaw the new law or to hold it invalid is put on hold until the appeal plays out. And so even if they win, the new law could go into effect unless the judge not only rules in the favor of the plaintiffs and grants the injunction, but then after the state gets an automatic stay, he could lift the stay, which would then put back in place the injunction which would then prevent the new law from going into effect on July 1. It's gonna be fast and furious. It's gonna be wild, 
it's going to be a bumpy road, but on uh, Thursday is when they're saying there will be a discussion. Oh, by the way, there was something that came up before that I wanted to mention. I listened in on some of it. The state has a very peculiar position. The state is saying, well, at 15 weeks, it's entitled to protection. But I've never heard anybody argue that a, a, an embryo or fetus becomes human at 15 weeks. It's always conception. It's not 15 weeks. That's totally arbitrary and doesn't make sense. So the state of Florida has a little problem on their hands. They're trying to say that human life begins at 15 weeks. <clears throat> or if it doesn't begin at 15 weeks, they're allowing human beings to be murdered in the first 15 weeks of pregnancy. They've got a serious problem on their hands. How they're going to try to reconcile that, I heard, I heard a little bit of it, but it's an irreconcilable problem. And uh, there's no, of course, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Um, Harris, go ahead. We'll take one or two more and then we'll uh, call uh, it a day. I don't know if I read where I read this, but is the Supreme Court going to ban gay marriage? Yes, you you, uh, yeah, what you were reading is that uh, Clarence Thomas, in writing his opinion, expanded it even beyond Roe v. Wade. They said Roe v. Wade is not valid because right of privacy doesn't exist in the Constitution. It's something that was created by the courts and recognized for 50 years. But he said, I don't care if it's recognized for 50 years. It's not in the Constitution, so that right doesn't exist. The mm -hmm. problem that he has, or, or that people have said, is, well, if that's not in the Constitution, either is gay marriage. That's not in the Constitution, so that should be next to go. And same thing with... Um, different types of sexual acts, which, like, which are now criminalized, and that's not in the Constitution that you have the right to engage in those acts or in contraception. The problem that Clarence Thomas has is that in the Constitution, it doesn't say that Blacks have the ability to have freedom. And at the time of the Constitution, Blacks were slaves. So I'm not sure that he really wants to go back to what the Constitution has to say on some of these issues. He might okay. be better off um, abandoning that position. Okay, good. Thank you. By, by the way, these Supreme Court justices were selected not to do justice, but to do the bidding of an admitted abuser. I mean, uh, Trump uh, abused women, bragged about it, admitted it, and then when the people came forward, lied about it. So he's an abuser, a serial abuser, and he picked people to go on the court who would codify and enshrine his abuse in the law by repealing Roe v. Wade. So we, we have uh, Amy Phony Barrett, and we have Near Garnished. I don't know if you're familiar with the term garnished. It means uh, a nothing. And uh, these people were selected not based on their criteria of competence, but based on their willing to do the bidding of a corrupt president. They lied to get on the court, too, and so they didn't have any uh, opinion. But or, uh, rather, three of them appointed by Trump said that they considered Roe v. Wade to be confirmed solid precedent until they got on the court, then they abandoned it, so they lied. Clarence Thomas said, I don't have an opinion on Roe v. Wade. Now, either he's lying or he's the only one in the country that doesn't, and he, shouldn't, he should be disqualified for not caring about what's going on in the world. And then he's got a wife who's part of the insurrection and he's the lone vote saying that the president shouldn't have to turn over documents revealing about the insurrection. I mean, it doesn't get more corrupt than that. 